Jesus for inviting me. I, it's been really exciting yesterday, and you know, hope to continue that strong start. And I hope um, you know we'll have a good discussion. So I thought when I was thinking about what I should present, as kind of Mirta alluded to, I sort of am a little bit all over the place in terms of my work. Um, and uh, which is, you know, one of the privileges of being a theorist. You can just like wake up one morning and decide to work on a completely different question. Um, so I, I was wondering what I should present. And, and eventually I landed on the idea that I should talk about culture um, and, and the role of sort of group structure in different kind of culture because I think culture is, um, I'm going to talk more about it, is one of the sort of determinants of um, human collective action and collective agency, which is our topic. So, so I, I am, uh, you know, I, I am, as we were talking just before uh, the talk, uh, not even a recovering physicist, really. Like, I never, like, became, like, a full physicist because I, you know, got out of undergrad, after undergrad. You know, I did my PhD in biology. Um, but I, I do, you know, still, like, uh, retain some of the instincts that you know they teach you in undergrad physics uh, for like thinking about simple models and so on. Um, but as a biologist, I am used to sort of I come from this perspective. So we biologists think about adaptation by natural selection, and you know, uh, and I apologize to any plant or micro people here. These are all animals. Um, I mean, there's plants in the background, but you know, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of actually so all of these all of these things and microbes you can see the microbes you can never see the microbes but they're always there everything is done by microbes you know this whole talk is written by microbes um, the, the uh, so we think about when it's, we think about adaptation by natural selection and this is this is sort of what sort of fascinated Darwin obviously is like all of these things seem like you know there's all these like features of these animals or, or all these you know living organisms that seem uh, designed and that they're interlocking and they function as a whole, as a, as a unit, and they, they clearly like do something in the in the environment, right? They're, like the cheetah runs fast, you know the the, the seagull, like you know the um, flies, the uh, marine iguana, you know dives and all that kind of. So there's you know these particular adaptations that they they do, and we we understand how they come about by natural selection, uh, and in the last sort of 40, 50 years or so, we've also uh, started to recognize both in you know, non-human animals and obviously in humans that a lot of our adaptations are through not natural selection and through sort of genetically inherited uh, information, biologically inherited information, uh, but through information that is inherited through uh, culture or through social learning, okay? And, and these are some examples, so you, you have, you know, some obvious examples like human adaptations. You know, these are all cultural adaptations for uh, different environments, ecological, different ecological circumstances. But, but also uh, a lot of uh, animal adaptations. Now you can um, find like uh, foraging by tools with, by chimpanzees uh, or uh, different foraging techniques by humpback whales. Uh, and, and you can even teach birds, uh, you know, which you know, are not necessarily like have a reputation as the most cognitively sophisticated birds, right? Uh, to you know, solve new new tasks to get food essentially, and then they turns out turns out they learn learn those tasks from each other essentially, learn those uh, techniques from each other. So, so this this sort of adaptation by cultural selection or cultural evolution is pretty widespread in nature. It's not just humans, but obviously humans kind of excel at that. That's like if you have one adaptation that defines us, it's kind of this, you know, but we can do culture. We can use cultural adaptation to basically figure out to, where to live. And, and we, that's, that's basically what allowed us to colonize every single environment in the, on Earth, uh, which, you know, very few other species did, except by adapting to humans. Um, so, and, so, and these are, this, this sort of adaptation by cultural selection or cultural evolution relies on the social transmission of, um, uh, of skills, knowledge, beliefs, ideal, ideas, rituals, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, and, and by social transmission, we, we need uh, either, for social transmission, we need either some sort of observation of others, 
or we need, a, we need interaction with others, okay? I mean, either direct interaction, two-way interaction, or at least an observation of others, okay? So we need sociality for, for cultural selection. And, and the thing about all of these things is just like the, um, <clears throat> the cheetah's physiology, like muscle physiology and, you know, the bone structure and the, uh, the, uh, the metabolism and so on, um, all of these adaptations are interlocking and they're sort of, they, uh, they are co-adapting to each other, right? They work together and, uh, and you can kind of see when you go to a new sort of human society, you can kind of discern that there are elements of their culture that kind of work together and sometimes they don't work together and when it doesn't work together, you, you, you discern some conflict, you discern some, discern some, some, some uh, dissonance, okay. So, so what does that have to do with collective agency, which is our topic here, right? Um, so the way I see it, collection, collective action and collective agency is both enabled by culture, okay, and it's also both constrained by what are the cultural traits, what are the social transmitted, sort of the collection of social transmitted information, available information, um, or information, beliefs, skills, and so on. So when I say culture, I leave it, I, generally I leave it sort of vague, and that's intentional, because it includes both sort of things like beliefs that are sort of a bit more sort of, uh, you know, inside one's mind, uh, but influence people's behavior. But also things like, more concrete things like skills, being able to do certain things. Um, so, so Helga actually had a very nice slide yesterday, uh, which I thought I would give a shout out, because one of the main ways culture determines if influences so, um, collective agency is that it, it, it determines, it both constraints and enables sort of the, what problems are you even aware of? What problems do you think you know, a group takes ownership of, like, okay, this is a problem we can solve, uh, and, and how they frame the problem, okay? Like, we're, like, so there's a particular way, for example, we frame the problem of climate change, okay? And, and this is, that way is sort of, from our perspective of, you know, people and academics in like developed countries for the most part, right? That, um, that framing is very much influenced by our background and, and for a lot of us, it's our background as, you know, ecologists, for example, uh, or physicists. And, or, or actually, my framing as an ecologist might be different than your framing as a, as a physicist, for example, right? So, so culture determines what, that, what, what, problem, what problem is even perceived and how it is framed. And also, it determines, obviously, the, the technologies that we have to address it. And these technologies include both sort of material technologies, so, so for example, for climate change, it, you know, batteries or you know, solar panels and so on, that's an obvious technology, but also social technologies, so how we interact with one another and how we organize interactions, okay? Um, and, and which sort of is going to be most of the talk, actually, is going to be about, in a way, about those social technologies. Um, and, and, of course, culture can also be the target of collect collective action, and this is very, we are, we're very much um, familiar with this, you know, from our lifetimes, right? You know, 20 years ago, most places on earth, you know, people could be smoking in this room, right? Um, because that was an acceptable thing, right? Maybe 25 years ago, I don't know about, about Italy. Maybe, maybe five years ago, I don't know. Uh, in Turkey, it was like 10 years ago. In the US, probably like 15, 20. Um, but um, but that, prob that is not acceptable anymore, right? So that's like a, that's, that was a cultural change, norm change, that was the uh, was actually the target of explicit collective action. There was, it was driven by government action initially, eventually, right, because the government made rules a lot of places, but, but the reason government made rules was there was a lot of uh, pressure on the government to do that, to make those rules, because it was, we, we f finally figured out, despite Fisher, that smoking actually kills, right? Uh, the R.A. Fisher spent last, you know, the, the, the very last part of his life like being a shell for tobacco companies. Uh, if you didn't know that, look it up. Um, <laughs> so uh, I like you know dissing on Fisher every now and then, um, but of course and of course now, now we're we're also um, uh, there's also a lot of you know collective action trying to uh, address gender and sexual arrest, orientation discrimination right uh, in a lot of different fields including science uh, and it is kind of this 
and, and smoking is sort of like one concrete activity, right? Like you can, and the norms around it, you can, are, are relatively easy to address because they're all norms around one activity, right? This is harder, right? This is a, a more a nor, amorphous set of norms and expectations and behaviors, and you have to figure out first where they are, and, and just getting them to recognize actually is, is sort of a function of, you know, the, the awareness and the framing and what, what cultural norms exist in the population, okay? So, so this is why I think culture actually is central to all of these collective action problems and, and collective agency, because kind of culture is kind of like the, the, the group's DNA in some ways, okay? And, and the DNA and the group's DNA is essentially like determines what, 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 option, what options do you even have to change, essentially, what's, what's evolvable and, and what opportunities or challenges you can address. Okay, and of course, we're also, we're, we're, we, we are very interested in collective action for sustainability, and, and here are some of the things that we need to address, right, for, uh, you know, our current challenges. So, so we need to switch from, you know, heating our homes with gas, for example, to, uh, this is, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a gas furnace typical in, the, in a U.S. home, to heat pumps, which electricity. Um, we need to stop driving these idiotic vehicles and start driving these elegant ones. Um, we need to, and, and most sort of difficult, and, and again, these, are, these, these two are maybe easy, right? Because this is especially easy, because you only care that your house is warm, right? You don't really care whether you're burning gas or whether you're using electricity for that, right? And, you, and this is a little bit harder because a lot of people like their cars. There's a lot of cultural norms around cars, okay? Uh, I don't understand that, but a lot of people do. Uh, and, and it turns out like people get angry, for example, in the US, if you say like, oh, well, we don't like cars, right? Um, and bikes, you know, have, you know, different reputations to overcome and cyclists and so on. Right? This is harder because there's a, there's a more, more sort of an amorphous cloud of norms around us, okay? This is mainly sort of an economic incentives, right? You, you make heat pumps available, or maybe you subsidize them a little bit, and a lot of people will switch next time they replace their furnaces, okay? Um, this is the hardest one, because, and, but it's, it's also probably one of the most necessary ones because we need to change what we eat, okay? And I was listening to a podcast about, um, uh, with um, Hannah Ritchie who wrote a book about sort of um, climate solutions and, um, and, and either her or the host on the podcast made the made made observation that, you know, food is hard because uh, food is like a decision that we make every day. Right? And because it's a decision we make every day, we, and every culture has a lot of expectations and like norms around food, okay? And, and they feel very strongly about it, you know? Just, you know, um, you know ask, you know, you know, I'm from Turkey, ask, you know, a Turkish guy, you know, if, they, if the donor in Turkey is better than the donor in Germany, right? <laughs> so, um, and, but, but we do need to change what we eat because our current food production system, which produces an enormous amount of meat, is uh, unsustainable. Like, there's just no way we can, we can keep that going and also extend it to a lot of the other people who are not eating as much meat as in the developed countries and, and still have a livable pl pl planet, okay? So we will have to sort of, something has to give, and it could be either be sort of we switch to foods that are currently available. These are vegan foods that are currently available or vegetarian and vegan food, or we, we invent new foods, okay? But then we have to convince people to choose them, okay? So, and this is hard, it's like, it's this, the, we have to change a lot of norms. Okay, so those, those are all functions of culture, and this is how you make culture. Um, very profound slide. Uh, so, this is a simple recipe, okay? And, we take this for granted. This is, this is the wet part of like us being fish, right? We don't even think about, you know, when we invent something and someone picks it up and then they repeat it or modify it and pass it on or combines things and so on, we don't even necessarily think about it. We just, it's just like part of what happens, part of what being a human, okay? So, um, but, but it turns out studying this actually comes up uh, with really interesting insights. Um, so, so this is um, the more specific talk of this topic of this talk. Um, uh, 
a lot, and, and specifically, actually, I'm going to focus on this transmission part uh, in, this, in this talk. Uh, although, this coming up with something new, the innovation part is also very important. I, I'll briefly touch upon it in the, at the end. Uh, and combination of things is also very important, uh, which I'm not going to talk about a lot, but it's, you know, that's not because it's not important, because it's mainly because it's hard. And I, as a rule, I don't do hard problems. <laughs> um, no, I, I haven't gotten around to it. We, we started this project for trying to get at this, but we're still like here, <laughs> okay? Um, so um, so here's, here's sort of some things we know, okay? So, and these are empirical, all empirical studies. Um, so uh, the structure of a group, who interacts with whom, obviously affects how information gets transmitted. Because if you don't interact with someone, you can't get information from them. And everybody knows now like that uh, the, you know, the second order interactions, third order interactions, and the, the, the overall structure of the network can be very important on, in transmitting information. And this, been, this has been shown in lots of very cool systems. <coughs> like um, humpback whales, this is uh, humpback whales doing us this, this bubble um, hunting behavior. But um, <coughs> about 20 years ago, uh, maybe a little more, one uh, humpback whale individual invented a new technique where they they slap the uh, water before with their tail before they're doing this, and that's taught to actually like you know target a different fish species uh, because in part because it appeared right after their main prey uh, kind of collapsed fishery collapsed and they had to switch prey species uh, in the Gulf of Maine and and you can. <coughs> And these guys, Jenny Allen and colleagues, have, have uh, tracked the spread of this behavior on the, on the humpback uh, whale network. Um, as a really cool paper. Uh, Lucy Applin and colleagues have um, introduced, as I said, a uh, uh, population of gray tits and blue tits um, to a new sort of uh, behavior to get uh, food from a feeder. And, um, they had to. They had set up feeders to that so that the birds had to do a sequence of two two activities to. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, to get food, and then they teach a few individuals that behavior, and then look at how that behavior spreads over the network. Uh, this is a very cool experiment in the field by Alicia Carter, um, where she teaches one baboon how to handle a new food item that they've never seen before, and then looks at how that information gets transmitted along the network. Um, and, and you can, you can now, and, and these are just examples of not, the things that we can do now. We can, even in the wild, not just in humans, even in wild animals, we can get, uh, we can teach them new things, and we can actually spread, we can actually detect how it spreads through a network, and which network it spreads through. So we can get a lot of information about that. Right. Right. Yeah. Like the printing press. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course. Yeah. So you don't. You, the network becomes a lot different when you when you have written culture. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. The, the, yeah. I, I agree. Um, so this is. Um, yeah, I agree. That's a good. That's a good caveat that to keep in mind. So a lot, a lot of this has to is through um, um, for things that are uh, spread through uh, kind of direct interaction. Okay, I would say though uh, the scope of direct interaction, even if you have symbolic culture and even if you have like written material and so on, and, and artifacts uh, that can be passed on and replicated and so on, is still quite a bit. Uh, I mean, we've seen, I mean, this is why we're in here, right? Because otherwise, like, we wouldn't have workshops. Um, and we still learn a lot from direct interaction from each other and discover things that we wouldn't otherwise discover. Then we can go and read the paper, right? But, and, and get the details from the paper. But a lot of times, the discovery actually de still depends on the, you know, direct personal interaction. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree. I, I'm not saying like this is the, 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 the models that I'm going to present are not sort of like meant to sort of apply to the, in the most general case. Um, the, the correct scale for, for these models, I think, in my mind, is, the, is sort of a, is a local group that is trying to sort of adapt to sort of an environment, environmental change, okay? Uh, or, or some environment, either constant or changing environment. But, <clears throat> but it, it's not necessarily like a model of like global culture or global collective action, but it's much more local and group level collective action. Uh, but I think it does give you some insights about like what that, um, it does give you some, some insights that can be potentially translated into other contexts as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> other things that are inf influenced by network structure, not just transmission, <clears throat> are things like innovation. This is work from Susan Perry uh, showing that more sociable capuchins, uh, capuchin monkeys like innovate more behaviors. And capuchin monkeys are weird because they do really, really freaky behaviors like, like poking out each other's poking at each other's eyeballs, and we, and, and we don't know what they do, it, but they, they seem to think it's fun. And they do innovate behaviors, weird behaviors like that, uh, fairly regularly. And turns out uh, Susan Perry, who has studied them for, for decades in the jungle, um, and have, have found that the more sociable, the more, uh, the more interactive a, a capuchin monkey is, the more they're likely to invent those kind of social traits. <coughs> It kind of goes the opposite way for actually foraging inventions uh, for capuchin. But um, this is a paper with uh, uh, Derex and Boyd, uh, Maxine Derex and Rob Boyd, uh, showing that the network structure affects how uh, fast people, how good solutions people come up with, uh, with when they try to come up with a task, with when they're forced with a task where they have to com invent new things and combine them to get a new drug, uh, sort of in a play drug. And then this is a very cool paper by uh, Coleman et al. Um, <clears throat> who did like a network uh, uh, manipulation in, in a sort of recall study. So they just gave these, peop these two people uh, one in a piece of information with like different pieces, like someone's name and age or something. I forget the exact details because uh, I'm not in a clustered network. Uh, and then, or non-clustered network. Uh, and, then, and then asked them to transmit them and then asked about, and then, Asked them like to recall that information, and turns out uh, whether the transmission network was clustered or non-clustered determined the, the recall, and the, the more connected networks did better um, recall. So, <coughs> excuse me. So all of this says that social structure affects the, a lot of these sort of components of cultural evolution, cultural accumulation, and uh, so. But when we started this, there wasn't a lot of work about how where the social structure itself comes from. Okay, and this, is, and this has been something I've been interested in for a while now, um, because it turns out social structure affects everything, social, the evolution of everything social. Um, so we wanted to ask, like, how does it, the pressure to accumulate certain kinds of culture, or how does the accumulation of culture, or does it select for different kinds of social structure, and what's the feedback between those two processes? Okay, and, and in came uh, Marco Smola, pictured here, as, who was a postdoc in my group, um, and, and we, started, we, we started thinking about this by essentially using an agent-based model um, and that we already had for network dynamics and then um, adding culture on top of it. Okay? And the model that we had was, is, is based on this simple idea. <coughs> and, and this idea has been around sort of in, in economics and physics literature for a bit. And it's a very simple idea, actually, of meeting friends with your friends. Okay? And, um, because that's a lot of times how you build uh, network ties. And in, in the context of an animal group, which we were thinking about uh, when we first started this work, um, you know, when you, a lot of times when you make the, the, the new connection is when you first arrive at a group, or, and which is a lot of times when you're born into a group, okay? if you're thinking about a stable social group. So we have a model where individuals are born or, or, and removed from the group, and then when they're born, they make new connections. And when someone else is born, they might also make new connections with that. And that's how the network changed. And <coughs> we call this the social inheritance model because, simply because the, we assume that the newborns make two connections, two way, make connections in two ways. Well, then they know their mother, okay? And they also have some probability of inheriting their connections from their mother. So meeting people who their mother knows, okay? So that's this variable PN. 
Uh, and then, so network connections, so the, that's the probability that the newborn will make connections to its mother's connections, and then they may also go out and, and make connections to some random person in the, who's not connected to the, to the mother. So it's a very simple model. You can do a lot of like fun things with it, and you can do, you know, you can, and then you can show that it sort of, if you squint enough, it sort of generates realistic looking networks. And we've also been able to actually look at sort of some long-term data from spotted hyenas and, and actually document this, that this inheritance does take place in, in that species, okay? So, so that's sort of other work. So, so let's put culture on top of this, okay? So let's put a, this, imagine a population that where you're born and you make connections and then you use those connections to learn something from it, from, from, your, from, from the uh, existing, from the knowledge of, the, of the, your connections, okay? And we're interested in sort of cumulative culture. And, and we're interested in culture sort of that can accumulate in two ways. Either you can accumulate new, like you can accumulate a variety of things. You can accumulate new information or new skills, or you can sort of level up, okay? And this is kind of like a, thinking about this is like a, almost like a, you know, computer game, right? So you can, you know, you can pick up new skills or you can become a higher, you know, proficiency in that skill, okay? Uh, so, so here, each of the individuals here, have uh, a, a repertoire, okay, which are these sort of emojis. So this guy has knows like knife work, uh, pottery, um, fortune telling, and some medicine, okay, and then has some level of proficiency. And these levels, I'm going to assume they're just like you know discrete levels. So it's, I'm just going to call them one, two, three. Okay, one is the lowest level. If you're zero, you don't know it, um, and so on. Okay, so then each of these individuals have different <laughs> skills, okay, and and the newborn will acquire the skills only from those that is connected to it, okay? And, um, and how is it gonna acquire the skills? So we need to specify a model of social learning and, well, two, there are actually two things that the newborn can do. The newborn can like, just come up with a new skill because, you know, uh, innovate something, okay? With some generally low chance. Uh, and that could be either coming up with a new skill or leveling up in an existing skill. Or the social learning, which is a, uh, typically going to be higher probability. Uh, they, and to, social, to do social learning, the newborn has to observe the trait, okay? And, the, and we're going to assume that the observation, we're, we're keeping things very simple. So this observation is, is sort of undirected. So it's going to be proportional to the uh, frequency of the trait around the, in the newborn's neighborhood, okay? So... <coughs> and, and we're also going to assume, and this is, there is a lot of evidence for this, and this is actually the crucial assumption in all this model, that in order to learn the trait, the newborn has to observe the trait multiple times, okay? Because it turns out a lot of sort of complex traits, a lot of, you know, cultural, both sort of beliefs and, and cultural sort of, and cultural transmitted skills or norms of behavior, they, they aren't picked up just by observing once, but they have to be observed multiple times, okay? It, this, this could be either because they're, you know, they go, you know, they're hard to pick up because they're complicated, difficult traits or the skills, or it could be because there's, um, you know, they go, they have, you have to change the norms that you ad adhere to, which usually takes, you know, multiple iterations of reinforcement. So in this one particular example, this is sort of the inventory of traits that the newborn can see, okay? This is the individuals with trait among the newborn's connections. So, so the newborn will not actually see the fortune telling and medicine traits because it's not connected to, uh, this is the newborn, so it's not connected to this guy. So therefore, uh, and that guy is the only one that knows the fortune telling trait. Um, so, so this, so, but the, all three of the connections know the, know the nice trait and the potter trait, so, the, uh, so this is three. So the probability of obser observing uh, <coughs> these traits is, um, is 0.3, and the probability of delivering, you know, water and <laughs> microscope and the nuts and bolts uh, is uh, 0.1, 0.2, and 0.1, again. So, and we're going to assume that the probability that you learn is proportional to the square of that, okay? So, it, uh, so and this is a, this is a, you can think of this either as sort of, you can use, you don't have to use the square uh, here, but you can use, you need to use any kind of, any kind of sort of nonlinear um, concave up function works. 
Um, and, um, but, but you can think of the square as sort of the expre expression of the fact that you have to observe things twice, essentially, right, to learn. But you could also use the cube for three times and so on. And all of this still works. So, so then, so then we want, so now we have what you, uh, what you know. So then this newborn, of, of, you know, picks up some things. So now it actually picked up the fortune telling, not by social learning, but through individual innovation, basically. And it also picked up some other traits through individual innovation, which it can do. So, so let's, let's then say this culture has fitness consequences, which will, you know, because we're interested in cultural adapt adaptation. And, and we have two, we started with two scenarios. One is that suppose we select for bigger repertoires. So we don't care about the proficiency much, but we, we care about how much you know, like how many different things you know, okay? In this case, this guy actually would be the, the winner, right? Because it knows, it knows six different traits. So it has the most, you know, the biggest repertoire. <coughs> Excuse me. The other scenario is that the, um, the um, uh, proficient selection where we only care about sort of the highest proficiency, okay, for, for simplicity's sake. But um, now we don't care how, about how many things you know, but we just, know, we just care that you know something, something really well, okay? And see if that, <clears throat> and then what we then do is we let these sort of connection probabilities, PN and PR, this, the probability of inheriting connections and making random connections, be heritable traits, so genetically heritable traits from parent to offspring, and let them evolve, okay? based on what they pick up from their neighbors, based on socially, pick, socially picked up information. Okay, so, so this is the first result. So when you select for, it turns out, when you select for a repertoire, you select for um, sparsely connected networks, okay? So the blue is the repertoire selection, okay? And the typical network you get is this, this kind of network where uh, most, there's, most individuals have one or zero connections, few individuals have two. Um, there's a long average path length, uh, the mean degree is low, and so on, okay? And, and, and not surprisingly, that gives you a higher, uh, well, not surprisingly because we selected for repertoire size, we, we select for a higher repertoire size because that's what we selected for, okay? Somewhat surprisingly, we don't, it's not that much higher. But basically, proficiency is zero. I mean, proficiency is like at the lowest level because you know, zero is actually, you don't know it, but proficiency is at almost one. Most of the traits are only at one, Proficiency, and these are, by the way, these are sort of the mean values from different networks, different sort of simulation, simulated networks. Okay. Uh, yes. Know, sorry. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that maybe at a certain point in IE connection you see it, where in IE degree you may have that you observe things more than uh, ten times, <coughs> and then in, how do you define the probabilities at the end of the number of uh, your neighbors? <laughs> it right. happens that you have more than 10 neighbors with one skill, and then you must calculate the probability. Oh, I mean, this is, I mean, technically, <coughs> this, is this is divided by the, by the total repertoire size of your neighbors. Ah, right, okay. so, so this is, it is, it is normalized. Yeah, I didn't go through the whole calculation, but it is normalized that, so that these probabilities always add up to one. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Deborah. Um, sparsely connected network is just like low degree, yes. Um, so yeah, and and you do tend to get also get sort of like disconnected networks, the disconnected components in the sparsely connected networks. But it's really the degree, um, and but also it's the this, the average path length. So I'm um, because the average path length actually gets you this uh, essentially isolation by distance. So if you look at sort of the, 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 the trait abundance diagram, right, the, like, like the species abundance uh, diagram, right, so these are sort of traits ordered by how, how many people know in the network. If you select for proficiency, you get uh, a few traits that everybody knows, okay, so they're almost at abundance one, okay, and then most of the traits are very low of abundance. Everything else is at very low abundance, whereas for repertoire selection, you get a much even distribution. There are some traits that, you know, get to Si sizable frequency, but few of them, and then most of them are, are very low frequency. Okay, so you get, you know a lot, the network knows a lot of different things, um, but every individual, and every individual knows a few more things, actually, but the network as a whole knows a lot more things, and that's what the, the, the sparse 
the, the, the longer path lengths between individuals get you because you essentially get isolation by distance uh, the way you would get in a you know, stepping stone model in population genetics. Um, whereas if you select for proficiency, you select for very densely connected networks. Everybody's, the average degree is much higher. And then you lose some repertoire size on average by the, you, in, per individual, but you get a lot of proficiency for that. <clears throat> and the reason is, Proficiency goes up when someone innovates a, a next level, okay, when someone sort of in, invents the next level in the trade, and then that invention gets socially transmitted. Because you can't socially learn something, high, we assume, we can't social, you can't socially learn something that, that's higher level than all your connections, right? You have to innovate it yourself, right? If, if the maximum level in your connections is five, you can't get to six through social learning, okay? So someone has to innovate this, the next level, okay? And then that innovation has to be not lost. And being highly connected gets you there, okay? But being highly connected gets you there only because it also lets the population to converge on these few traits, okay, that everybody knows. Because if everybody was trying to innovate different traits, right, trying to innovate proficient in different traits, <clears throat> then those would get those would only be at low frequency in any given neighborhood, and they would, be, they would have a bit much lower probability of being learned, okay, being, trans, being transmitted, and therefore they wouldn't survive. So a highly, connect, but, but highly connected network is able to coordinate on a few traits, okay, and those few traits can sustain repeated innovations and repeated improvements in proficiency, and, and therefore uh, those, that proficiency level sort of uh, stay in the in the network, and this is sort of this this is the same networks that I've shown before. Um, these are two example networks. This is sort of specialists sort of have this like hairball network, uh, the special select networks, and the generalist and specialist is proficient selection, and the general sort of repertoire selection has this sort of sparse and like this kind of strung out strung out networks with with few connections. Okay. Does your probability of innovating depend on your degree? No, no, that's a good question. It doesn't here. Uh, it's constant for everybody. And by the way, this is both social learning and individual learning happen over repeated rounds. So you have repeated opportunities for learning socially and individually. Um, and, and, but, but every single round has a low probability of either event happening. So, yes. <coughs> Right, yeah. So if you had professional, professional attachment, this would potentially change. But I think it's clear at this point, social networks are not, like real life social networks are not, they don't look like professional attachment networks, right? Like, like, peer -to, like, individual, like face to face networks, like online networks kind of do, but like face to face networks don't look like. So, so this is, so here there's no professional attachment, but there's a sort of attachment through your parent essentially, or your, your your, your network parent. When you talk about specialization, you know, I would say it's specialization. That, yeah, I mean, it's, if, you were, if you knew that you were selected for specialization, you could decide to go like, okay, I'm gonna go specialize, like connect to someone with, uh, with high, high proficiency, if you knew what their proficiency were, was, right? Uh, but, but if you were just arriving at the network and you don't actually know, who, what traits people have and what proficiencies they have, and you, because you have to first figure it out, then you, you wouldn't have that information, right? So, so this is sort of, again, like, there's a lot of, like, specific elements that you can introduce this model, but we're, we're keeping this intentional and simple to get at some trade-offs. And the trade-offs essentially is, I mean, the reason this happened is, um, which I meant to say, the reason this happens is that because of this sort of square, this is that because the learning, uh, is follows this sort of uh, uh, follow this follow this nonlinear form where if you have a lot of different things, okay, because it's co proportional to the square of your the probability of things around you. If you have a lot of different things, you just learn less, okay. Um, and to pick up some things, to to ensure that something gets picked up and gets transmitted, it has to be around everybody. Uh, it has to be. Uh, present in almost everybody around you, okay? 
to make sure that it gets picked up with a high probability. Okay, it, its frequency around you has to be high, right? So that's why that's why specialist networks have to co have to converge to a few traits because otherwise they don't get to transmit those traits reliably. Okay, and proficiency does not get maintained. Yeah. Yeah, this is the steady state. Yeah. The, there is, I mean, there is no, for, there is no forgetting, uh, but there is forgetting at the network level in the sense that you, we remove individuals from the network. We keep removing individuals from the network. So, so, so what they learned just disappears when they get removed, right? So, so, so that's, that's why there's a limit to how much proficiency you can accumulate because, you know, um, there's, you can only accumulate proficiency and, and transmit proficiency within your lifetime. So, but there's no individual level for getting. Right. 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 Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's not in the, in, that's not here because you're talking now about like a kind of a coordination game, right? So, so these traits have payoff that's independent of like whatever everybody else has, you know, has whatever everybody else's traits are. So that's not in the model. So, so I think that's, a, that's an interesting, that is an interesting question. Uh, I mean, there is experiment that where they, there's like experiment the naming game and that show actually that, that well-connected networks, in fact, do converge very quickly on the same names. Um, like Damon Santola's uh, experiments. Yeah. If you have any forgetting in there, oh, I, I don't know that. I don't think they, he had forgetting in that experiment that I saw. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. So I, I agree. I, I don't, I agree with that that could. Individual level forgetting can, I don't think it's going to change this dynamic, but can add, add another layer to this. Because um, this dynamic, like I said, is very straightforward, follows from this sort of, the fact that learning is frequency dependent and it has a sort of, you know, nonlinear accelerating function and frequency dependence. Um, that's like, that's what's causing this, okay. Um, individual learning and potential sort of interaction between individuals, that, that's going to change, I mean, learning and in, forgetting and potential interaction with different traits of different individuals. We haven't done that. I think that's going to be very interesting, but that's one of the open questions. Um, so this model, like I said, this model is in some ways extremely simple. It's a stupid model in many ways, right? But it gives you something interesting. And I, I'm running out of time, but I, there's, like, there's a follow-up to this that's, that's even more interesting than this. So I want to get to that. So, but before I get to that, actually, I want to make one point, that these specialist networks, they accumulate high proficiency, but they can also get stick, stuck they can also get stuck there. So, so this is where we, so this is the so experiment that we did, uh, simulation we did, where we imposed generalist selection, repertoire selection, then uh, proficiency selection, and then repertoire selection again. And for the most part, most of the networks kind of follow the selection pressures. You know, they become generalists when we impose repertoire selection and specialists when we impose spe uh, proficiency selection. But some of them, some of these, uh, networks, even if we switch back to repertoire selection, they cannot switch back because they are stuck in this well-connected state and they never can get out of this sort of echo chamber essentially where they keep learning the same trace over and over again and they can never get disconnected basically. So, so, they, so if you're a generalist, if you're a specialist population, there's a, there's a chance that you get stuck there. Okay. So, but that was a pretty heavy-handed manipulation that we did. We either said, we don't care about your proficiency at all, or we, either, we said, we don't care about your repertoire at all. But a more sort of reasonable environment is where we could, we care about both actually. So your, maybe your payoff is, maybe you can get payoff both by, either by being a generalist or by being a specialist. And let's, let's not privilege one, one or the other so, and see what happens. So, so now we, so, so now we just, 
determine fitness as the, the product of you know, repertoire times mean proficiency. So basically just the sum of these numbers, okay? Some of your total proficiencies, okay? So, uh, in, and in that way, that's sort of a natural, in some ways that's a natural thing, uh, natural sort of neutral selection pressure because it doesn't matter whether you invent a new thing or you level up in, the, in an existing thing, okay? And terms, so, so when you simulate those, uh, <coughs> that, that kind of model, you get something quite interesting. So there's basically these two population states still persist, discrete population states still persist. So populations are either well-connected uh, here, okay, they have high linking probabilities, and then a high degree, and you know, basically everything is connected in one, uh, with one, compo one connected component. These are networks of size 100. Um, <clears throat> and they have, and then those populations have high average payoff, interestingly. Or they are less connected, low degree, and a bunch of like disconnected components, like here, and they have low payoff. But they have a lot more uh, population, a lot more traits in the population. So they maintain the total number of traits known to anybody in the population is a lot higher. Okay, so that's interesting because because these two population these two population states persist uh, over long term. So this is this is the, these are the steady state simulations. So these are simulations simulation runs, independent simulation runs that we run for a long time, and then just sample at a given point after running a long time. And you always find some of them here and some of them here. Even though this has a lot higher payoff, the, the well-connected state has a lot higher payoff than the less well-connected state. And this is why, um, and I need to click on this, yeah. So it turns out these populations, so this is in the random linking, this is the linking space, so this is the random linking probability and this is the social inheritance probability. Uh, the scales are different because the scales of these parameters turns out to be different. So this is a single population, the trajectory of a single population over time, and this is the trajectory of a whole bunch of populations, an ensemble of populations. And kind of what you can see here from this, from this and this is that populations tend to go through this kind of cycles, right? So they tend to either hang out here for a while or they quickly cross this, this valley or this crossing and they hang out here for a while and then kind of drift over here and then sometimes they cross over to this side and then hang out here again. Okay, so those are the two kind of um, attractors. And you can do this for a long, very long time for a lot of populations and then sample where the populations are over, like, over the steady state. And this is kind of the picture you get. So, uh, so now I've, I've sort of, we've sort of like put the PR, the random prob linking probability on a log scale so it's kind of just stretched out a bit. Um, and so the populations are either at this low connected, less connected state where they have low payoff, so they're color coded they're going to payoff, so darker means low payoff, and brighter means higher payoff, or they're at this high payoff state, okay, which is this entire region, okay. And then there's this valley between them, there's this sort of blank area between them, no man's land, where they don't tend to hang out, okay. So if you sample a population at steady state at a random point, you don't tend to find them there. And if you look at sort of what the, what the average payoff is across these cross sections, okay, what you find is actually, so here, this, this cross section is here, this is that cross section on, along this line, uh, you get the average payoff kind of increases the more connected you are here. Here too, the average payoff increases the more connected you are, okay, because we are, we are looking at sort of, we are fixing PN and increasing PR, and the higher PR is the more connected you are. But here, down here, where the, that transition back to the low connected state happens, there is this kind of fitness valley, okay? So you, you, if you're on this side, if you're to the right of it, you want to be well connected, okay? The populations, the mean payoff of the population is higher. When I say you want to be well connected, I, want to, I meant to say the population wants to be well connected because the population mean payoff is higher when, you, when it's more, more connected. But if you're to the left of it, if you somehow, somehow fell into this, you actually be, want to become, the population wants, is better off being less connected, okay? The population is better off being less connected, okay? So, so there's this sort of bifurcation, okay? There's this sort of fitness valley in terms of the mean fitness of the population. But, so, but that's fine, but like why would you fall into that valley? Turns out, and one reason is, we, we first thought that was just stochasticity because these are finite populations, you can just drift and maybe you find yourself in that, in that valley and then you go on the other side. Turns out that's not true because you can, uh, you can, you also get this in a lot bigger populations. 
and, and, and you can actually look at what the selection pressures are on these linking traits, um, uh, we, which we've done computationally here. So we've just taken sort of uh, populations that are fixed at a given linking trait and introduced mutants that, change, that are slightly different from the resident trait and then computed their fitness based on what they learned, okay? And, <clears throat> and blue here means the mutant has higher fitness and red means, me, red means the mutant has lower fitness. And, and so this is like high connection, high connection probabilities here. So, so the top, right, top row is high connection probability, high inheritance probability, and, you know, and this is the highest connection probabilities, uh, and then going down to lower probabilities. And in, but in all of these cases, you can see that the, the mutants that have slightly higher fitness, the mutants that have higher fitness, have lower connection probabilities in general, especially lower random connection probabilities than the residents. Okay, so, so, so that means there's individual selection against connectivity, yeah. So the colors are the mutant ratio of the mutant fitness to resident fitness. So if it's blue greater than one, the mutant has a benefit. The columns. Oh, the columns are. The columns are uh, the, the resident PR values, right? The resident probabilities of random linking given on top. And the rows are the resident probabilities of uh, social inheritance given at the, at the bottom. So these are resident traits. So we fixed everybody for those traits. And then we introduce a lot of individual mutants, you know, that uh, differ slightly from the resident. And for each panel, it's the, you know, this is the difference in the PR and this is the difference in PN. And then we calculate the average fitness of the mutant, basically. So, um, so then, uh, so then the average fitness of the mutant is higher when the mutant has lower connection probabilities, so especially random connection probabilities, okay? So that means that once you find yourself here, right, individual level selection actually, you know, <laughs> derives you into that fitness value. So the, the fitness value is in the group average fitness. That's the collective fitness, right? Individual fitness goes against that. It, it drives you into that ditch. And then you have to come out of that ditch on the other side, basically. Yeah. Why? Why is there a selection against the Exactly here. So, and it's because of, it's again because of that nonlinear learning probabilities. Okay. So, so in a well-connected population, you have a situation like this, where so you're, this is the newborn, this is the learner. Okay. And it's it's interacting with these three individuals that have this that all have this core set of traits that are that all have this core four traits, okay? These are sort of, I put them in a box. These are core traits. And, but each of them also have innovated in their lifetime some idiosyncratic traits because that happens, right? And innovation is sort of idiosyncratic. So they have this core set of traits and they have these idiosyncratic traits. So now the probability of you observe a core trait in this kind of scenario is 315, like one fifth. And probability of observing an idiosyncratic trait, one of these three, is 115. So the probability of learning the, uh, this should be core, Core trait is, you know, 0 0.04 in any given round. And probability of learning, because this is just the square of this, uh, probability of learning an idiosyncratic trait is 0 0.00444, right? <coughs> so, but what if, suppose the, the, this newborn, this learner, severed this connection, okay? So that connection is now gone. So now the probability of observing a core trait hasn't changed because all the connections still know it, okay? So the probability of learning that hasn't changed. But the probability of observing an idiosyncratic trait has gone from 1, 5, 1 over 15 to 1 over 10. So the probability of learning it has gone up from 0 0.004 to 0 0.01, right? More than twice, right? So by, connect, by disconnecting, you actually learn more because if you're, well, if you're a lot connected to a lot of different individuals who still have, like, they're, they have all the core traits, they're, tra they're, tra they're, they're teaching you the core traits, all of them. But they also have these idiosyncratic traits that you observe, right? That you can't help observing, right? So, and those distract you, basically. And that lowers your overall probability of learning. By disconnecting, you reduce the distraction and you increase your overall probability of learning, okay? But, but if everybody gets disconnected, then the core traits go away and you can't maintain the proficiency in those core traits and this high, high payoff state collapses, okay? So that's why, exactly, that's why there is this individual level selection for disconnection. Because, because learning requires this repeated exposures, and if you, repeatedly expo if you need to repeatedly expose, and there are too many things that, are you, that you're exposed to, uh, 
that you don't actually get to see all of them and you get distracted. This is actually called, in marketing literature, this is called choice overload. And there's a lot of experiments showing like if you give people like 20 different brands of like cans of tuna as opposed to like five, they are actually much more likely to leave the market without buying anything, without buying any can of tuna because they get overloaded by, by too many choices. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, this is kind of like the, this, this next thing is actually getting at that. Another sort of counterintuitive con um, corollary is that suppose you did this with different innovation rates. So suppose you, did, you, you changed the innovation rate of individuals. So the, this is the individual innovation rate. This is constant for everybody, no matter where you are. As you go from very low innovation rate to high innovation rates, the population mean payoff actually decreases which is counterintuitive because, again, culture gives you payoff here. Like, these are skills that are valuable. And if you can make it easier for individuals to come up with new valuable skills, you actually reduce the mean population of the payoff of the group, mean payoff of the population, because, uh, because what happens is that if, you, if individuals innovate more, they have more of these idiosyncratic traits, and there is more distraction, okay? And therefore, there is more dis incentive to disconnect. Conversely, if individuals innovate less, there is less distraction and there is less incentive to disconnect. Okay? And this is what this second graph shows, that the average weighted component size, which is a measure of how, connection, how connected the group is, uh, actually decreases. Uh, most of the populations have become disconnected as you increase the innovation success rate. And the population mean payoff only recovers if the innovation rate is so high, basically, that it replaces social learning. Um, I'm out of time, so, but, but you can do this in changing environments too, and changing environments kind of have the effect that you would expect. So if, if the environmental turnover is very fast, you want to be sort of a generalist, right? Uh, and you can also look at different traits having different payoffs, and if the variance between payoffs is high, between different traits payoffs is high, uh, and you have, you, there's very fast turnover, then you want to be more generalist, you, you want to be disconnected. If the variance is low and you have very slow turnover so that the environment stays constant, you do want to be specialist and like well-connected and coordinate on the high payoff traits and then learn them very well uh, because they, they, they pay well and they don't change very often and so on. Okay, so some general conclusions. Um, so high, this kind of results, and this is what we did, we did not expect this. We were actually like very sort of confused about this result at first, but then sort of understood and were very excited because this kind of shows that uh, there's this interaction between this social learning process, which kind of like this complex contagion or this nonlinear social learning probability and population structure that makes kind of this high proficiency or the group structure that can maintain high proficiency and high payoff cumulative culture on basically a public good because they give the highest payoff for the group, but there's selection at the individual level against those structures. Okay, so, and this is kind of the definition of the public group, right, which is something that benefits the group as a whole, but is individually costly, is privately costly. Okay. So, um, and, and this is a new kind of public good, but, and this is a structure, this, the, the structure of the group is the public, public good. Uh, and, and then you can think of, um, and the, the reason it's a public good is this high connectivity ensures that these improvements in proficiency don't get lost. So you can maintain a higher, or don't get lost as quickly, so you can maintain a high profi higher proficiency on average, okay? And therefore, more of the innovations actually remain in the population, okay? So it turns out, we, and we looked sort of the in the anthropology literature in this, so it turns out a lot of, uh, and, and you can kind of think of examples in your own sort of, uh, in a lot of cultures as well. Uh, many societies, both traditional and modern societies, have norms around interaction rates. People want, Generally, there's a lot of societies want people to interact with each other. Like if someone just like gets holed up as a, in, their, in their house and never interacts with someone, that's generally frowned upon, okay? And there are specific you know, rituals and uh, ritual meetings in like Aceh, for example, or in, in southern India, where that you, can kind of, you can kind of say that people, those, those function to you know, increase interaction rates. And, um, and that, that, that may have a reason. That may have the reason for like, maintaining this public good. Okay, because you have to, just like any, public other, any other public good, you may have some norms or institutions to get to maintain it. And, and lastly, sort of, uh, uh, the fact that, 
So there's two, two, two takeaways from this. One, connectivity can be a public good because it helps the group adaptation, okay? But it's, it may be disadvantaged for the individual. But even for group, even at the group level, because of the thing that I said about, I showed about the groups getting stuck in the specialist state, and also they, they can, I didn't show you this, but they can also get stuck when the environment has changed and the traits that were high payoff before are not high payoff anymore. It's harder for these well-connected groups to explore new traits. Uh, uh, it can also be a straight jacket, okay? Uh, because all innovations, all new things, start as idiosyncratic traits by definition, because they, they're new and one individual or a few individuals have them, okay? And, they, and these well-connected groups tend to snuff them out because they, get, they tend to get drowned by these sort of core traits, essentially. Um, and uh, so, you, so there's this trade-off between sort of being well-adapted and being able to adapt to new things, essentially, right, at the group level. In addition to this being well-adapted, being a public good. So, so, so some ways to break that, there's lots of ways to break that, and you can basically say, you know, one reaction to this talk is like, this is stupid, obviously there's like, people don't just like randomly observe things and just like have this square, which I agree with. But, but I think we need to understand why, why we have all these structures. So for example, one way to break this trade-off is you, uh, you have direct teaching. You tell people, or oh, go to someone and learn this, or someone figure out, I need to go to someone and learn a particular thing, right? Uh, so that breaks that frequency dependence, okay? The other thing is you can do division of labor. You can, have a, you can create a class of individuals whose job is to be well-connected with each other and really specialized and, and then like maintain that knowledge and you go to those people and learn it if you need it, okay? Academia, yeah? So, so that's like how you, why you have academics. So, so there's lots of sort of adaptations to, this kind of, to break this trade-off basically. But I think that the presence of this trade-off is kind of something fundamental. So, okay, and just to leave with some open questions. Um, okay, so given that there's this trade-off, and this model is very simple, uh, and there's, there's a lot of details that I introduced in this model, like social inheritance and so on, but actually, a lot of them actually don't seem to matter. We, we've done it with different kinds of models, and this, this, this general trade-off is general. This trade-off is more general than this. So given that trade-off, can we structure groups to be more adaptable, okay? And more, more adaptive and adaptable, and does that always come at the expense of being adapted now, being, having a high payoff now? Do you have, always have to sacrifice the, your current payoff to be able to sort of have some flexibility? Um, can we detect more adaptable groups? So for example, maybe, maybe if we want to look at sort of more innovation, we want to go to less connected groups, less sociable groups. Um, and the role of heterogeneity, we, all of these individuals are the same, basically. Uh, in our model. So there's no structure, there's no heterogeneity or no structure in the group. So obviously, you know, in a human society, in any human society, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So we don't know, we, we haven't yet figured out how heterogeneity actually breaks or exasperates this, 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 uh, this, this uh, trade-off. And, and also things like, you know, things like random heterogeneity, but things like <coughs> hierarchies or in, in sort of power or prestige and influence. Uh, those are all interesting questions. There's a lot more open questions, but I'll stop talking now. Okay, thank you. Well, it's time for um, me and Brian. Where is Brian? Over here. Okay, so we will um, um, make some introductory comments and questions, and, and then we will open it, uh, the discussion to the audience. So thank you very much for uh, a very interesting and kind of a wide, it's, it, it was like, it me, uh, reminds me a little bit of the, of the passage that says, for, from such a humble beginning, you know, and then we end up with this wonderful kind of a very simple model that has a lot of potential to uh, improve our, our understanding. and and. Uh, I was particularly interested in this uh, kind of uh, specialized and generalist dynamics, and reminds me of um, of this uh, eco-evolutionary uh, dynamics, which is called the taxon cycle. You know, and uh, that I don't know if you know it. It's something that E.O. Wilson did in the back in his fifties when he was studying ants in Melanesia and seeing that. Uh, populations usually, I mean, the species usually go from being uh, very generalist 
to, to where being specialized, and then either go extinct, and or they reinvent themselves and they do the cycle again. Uh, sort of what you also mentioned in terms of it is easier to go from generalist to specialized kind of a strategies, but not back. So there is a kind of a, a cycle, a very interesting connection there. But, but you know what I've, I really found really wonderful is, the, well, in addition of the connection between the social structure and um, the, the potential for community cultural evolution and the feedback between both, uh, the, the fact that somehow, let me put it this way, um, we discover network and information transmission and cultural evolution. Uh, and we put it into populations. So we actually realize that population of individuals are networks of exchange of information. Okay? So we, su we kind of uh, uh, superseded the traditional population biology paradigm where uh, our equations assume that all individuals were equal and they did nothing plus just uh, eating resources or interacting equally among themselves to all this complex structure. But I, I, I wonder, <laughs> here's the, one of the questions I have for you or commentaries, is that uh, th there is a lot of good stuff in population biology, meaning demography, <laughs> that hasn't been brought in into this question, into this structure. So you, you don't have birth and death processes there, so uh, you don't have ontogenies of individuals interacting at that change in the, the ability to actually uh, learn through time, and you don't have an environment. So, right. and I, I'm, I don't mean this as criticisms, it's like as, as kind of a, how, what if, uh, how difficult would it be to actually bring these two traditions, now the network structure of populations and the demography of population into a kind of a common ground? Yeah. That's, that's a great point. Um, one thing actually I will, I will clarify is we do actually have demography in the sense of death and birth. So this is a, that's how the death works change. We do keep the population sizes constant here. Um, but there's no, there's, that's not an intrinsic, like, that's not a necessary assumption of the model. And we do actually like, play around with the population size, which actually is, is a, and I didn't show because I, you know, I already talked too much, but there is, like everything in this model, there's nonlinearities, and population size has a sort of this unexpected thing, because larger populations essentially cannot help being, cannot help being specialist. Larger populations always end up being specialist, because it's very hard for you to get a really sparse population uh, in a larger population, it turns out. Um, and there's a lot more innovation there, right? So, um, so, so, if you, so based on that, you can f sort of actually kind of extrapolate that, for example, like a prey-predator dynamic, right? So suppose these are predators, and suppose these skills are learning to catch prey, okay? And the high-proficiency, well-connected ones catch prey more efficiently, right? So that means that they're going to be more efficient. They're going to go to, go to higher population sizes. They're going to be even more connected, even, more higher, even higher proficiency. And they're going to collapse the prey, potentially, probably. Right? So that kind of introduces this instability. And then, they'll have to dis they'll have, then the population sizes will connect, collapse, and they'll have to get disconnected again, and the cycle will start again. So this kind of creates potential this instability coming from the interaction of the network size, network dynamics, and social learning, and population size. We haven't explored that, but that would be my guess. Uh, based on what we know about population size here. Okay, so yeah. th that's, that's wonderful because it just set up the stage for my next question, that you assume perfect transmission of information. And if you put noise in there, then right. uh, the higher the population size, you will amplify the, the potential for new traits to emerge because of uh, imperfect copying. And, yeah. and in, uh, so that will generate, it will be the seed for innovations uh, from, the, from the system dynamic itself. Yeah. And, and that might eventually help to stabilize the, the dynamics. It could. I mean, to some extent, we already have that imperfect because social learning is not guaranteed. So you can actually not learn something. And you can also just like come up with something new, right? So in some of those, those components are both true. What we don't have is something like you try to socially learn and you learn something like not something completely different. We don't have that, but it, I don't think it would make that much of a difference. But I do think there's some, some of these effects where you go to learn some from 
you know, individuals, like particular individuals, because you need some information. And then that happens with, then it actually like social learning and noise in social learning will, will have an effect because we know from sort of more simpler models of like individual learning and like cumulative culture from like Joe Henrik with the, like the gumball distribution and so on, like the, um, that there is a stable sort of level of proficiency in, in those kind of models. Um, but there, there, the, there, there's no trade-off of different traits competing with each other, for example, because he's only looking at sort of learning one thing, right? So, so how that would work in this context, we haven't yet figured out, but potentially it will end up ever being a stabilizing force, yeah. Good, and I have a last question. Um, actually, is, is, is I would like to, to, to know what you think of the, what is the relationship between, <laughs> this is the, the elephant in the room, right. agency and culture. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have agency without culture? I, what's the relationship between <laughs> like two extremely ill-defined concepts? Um, <laughs> Let me, let me take, tackle that. You, you, uh, you can think, and I will uh, give the mic to yeah. uh, Brian. To... I, I, I think agency, you know, culture kind of determines agency. Culture, because culture determines how we conceive of ourselves. And, you know, whether we conceive ourselves of, of ourselves as individuals or groups, or, and, and kind of determines our strategy set as well. So, so, so I think culture is like infused in agency for humans. Culture is like, like infuses all, all level, all conceptions of agencies, both sort of its definition and its expression and it's like, and like just a practical matter of what, it, what, a, what an agent can do, right? So anyway, that's my answer. <laughs> and thanks, Pablo. You set up my first question very nicely. But um, first, thanks, Eero. Wow, you really covered so much. A really, thanks. really interesting presentation. And I, I liked your recipe, your circularity with right. the rinse and repeat in there. And so picking up, I think, on this last point was that one of your first slides you mentioned collective action is both enabled and constrained by culture. But I'm sure you'd be fine with this statement of culture is both enabled and constrained by collective action. Right. I, I'm fine with that too, yeah. Okay. So you I'm don't like know where to circular. begin because yeah. that's the connection between them. <laughs> okay. It's a circle. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tying in something Helga said yesterday morning when she was talking about concept-driven change, and she phrased it as seeing old things in new ways. And part of that is this idea of language matters. I think how we say things and how we, is how we think about them. And one of the things that, that kind of is a, a jumping off point, you said it briefly, it really wasn't a core to yours, but one, one of the things I wanted just to get across to the group is, um, so, so you mentioned um, change for climate solutions, cultural change for climate solutions. I really would encourage us to stop talking about climate solutions right. yeah. in general, because to me, a solution is something like you have a crossword puzzle and you solve it, or a Rubik's Cube and you solve it, or a math formula and you solve it and you're done and you put it down and you forget about it. We're never going to solve climate, ever. And we're not supposed to solve climate. It's like saying, I'm going to solve my marriage and I'm going to solve my parenting. It's an ongoing interaction that we have with it. It's a, it's a Wait, there's no the solution? Situation. There is no solution, I hate to say. So if we can change our lexicon and stop using climate solutions, I think that will, be, that will be a big step forward. But on that line, and you mentioned the gas furnace to the heat pump, right? So that's a good example. Yeah, we don't need to know where it's coming from. Um, we'll probably be likely to do that. But I thought it was interesting that you said that um, the food would be the hardest. And I do see the connection back to the end where you said there's a straight jacket that, um, that culture gives us that the change is hard. But that's a cultural straight jacket. And I think the, the car to the bike is the harder change because the straitjacket is the built environment. So we can change our perceptions just because. We can't change our built environment just because. Um, um, so, so what is your reaction to that? Um, I sort of disagree, actually, because built environment changes can change pretty rapidly if there's a will. A lot more money, though. More, well, yeah, but like the amount of money to take it, I, it well, we can debate this. But I mean, it has, all I can say is, Change in, like built environment has changed. I mean, like, right. like most notably, we were talking about this. You were mentioning, right? Like, you know, you see pictures of Amsterdam or any Dutch city in like the 60s and 70s. I mean, they look like any Amer any American city. Like, they're like there's a there's a traffic jam, like cars everywhere, and they just like decided to change that. And the way they ch changed that actually was a bunch of kids got killed by by, by being hit by cars, and the Dutch said. Why are we taking this? And they organized extremely large, like ex there was an extremely active sort of, uh, you know, uh, social movement 
to against cars, like, and they like they they didn't flinch away from like because in the U.S. it's like we we're talking about like, you know, total streets and so on. We we're sort of dancing around this thing. Where we should, like, there's a podcast called "The War on Cars." I love it. <laughs> it's like we should just say declare war on cars. The Dutch did it because like that social movement was like, cars are the problem. We 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 don't want cars, and they they organized die-ins. They organized a lot of protests and so on, and they did, they made change happen. And the the when the bill like is there, like when the cultural change is there. You know, the built environment actually kind of is like it's trivial to change really. Like you can you don't even have to do anything. You just say like you just put two bollards on two sides of the street. That's it. It's a it's a bike and pedestrian infrastructure. So you're saying if the culture changes, then the, the infrastructure will follow. Yeah. That's what people want. Yeah. yeah. With 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 food, like that's like you have to change the decisions of everybody, right? Like with the with the infrastructure, you have to change the decision of the mayor. Right? It's like in some ways, right? That you can do a lot of top-down thing, you know, but, okay. but that's, I mean, sure. I, I, don't, I don't claim expertise in this, yeah. but that would be my guess. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, and just the last point, I, I really liked how you, you brought in institutions at the end and the role of institutions, and so that's taking it to the next level, yeah. and, and that they are actually playing the role of uh, encouraging the interactions and so on. Even if it's individually costly, it's good for society. Right? Yeah. So, but, um, yeah, so questions. Hi. So this was really interesting. And I, um, I would like to discuss this first point. Can we structure groups to be more uh, adaptable? So uh, quite some time ago, uh, I was a co-author on an article uh, that we have dogmatism and naive empiricism in the title. Right. And I usually think about adaptation in those two terms. Like, we need something to dampen things. <laughs> we need right. another thing that makes us more open to experiences and learn things. And I'm thinking then, how can we structure groups? Here we have... So you talk about connected groups. So what about we uh, uh, here um, also introduce uh, directed links and the multi-level networks? Mm -hmm. So usually in, in, in the human groups and other groups, we have like a leadership, we have others under the leadership and right. so on and so forth. So can we think about it like we can have individual learning basically or more or less connected individuals that that feeds into another layer, layer of, right. of individuals that can vary in size and the size can then be more or less dampening uh, and also over time, these uh, connections can change, like in times of crisis or war or something, we can change the connection more yeah. to be hierarchical, and in other times, this can change to other things. What do you think about those things? Yeah, I think those are all possible. Uh, yeah, I think those are probably good solutions. I think like this kind of like a core periphery type structure or sort of like a specialized subgroup that like maintains and you know, like dampens, as you said, it's a good word. Um, sort of change and maintain sort of like a core knowledge, but then allowing, the trick is like allowing, you know, things, input from the periphery, right? Because it turns out like the things that maintain the core, core, you know, culture are things that also make it harder for like new things to come in, right? And that's like kind of a fundamental trade-off. There are ways to go around it, but I kind of feel like when we first, when we did the first paper, I thought like we, like I was surprised, I, because, you know, if you're like, Kind of like, if you just like are peripherally aware of like I don't know management, you know organizational studies and so on, you know, most people say like connections is, are good things because like being networked is good thing and like that's a that's you know that works makes an organization more innovative because you bring in new things and so on, and then we we kind of like just like hit our like we stubbed our toes on this thing which we didn't expect, uh, where being connected kind of like just locks you in, it just becomes, makes you an echo chamber because of the social learning thing. So, and give, if you believe, which you may not believe it for some, some, some certain, certain things that are social trends, but if you believe this sort of like nonlinear learning model or like this complex contagion learning model, it's very hard to get away from that, from that phenomenon, right? So then you have to kind of like break that nonlinearity at the individual learning process, okay? And that's where I think actually like reading a book is great, right? Because reading a book is not necessarily the same kind of frequency, right? Um, so, but it's also not very social. <laughs> so, so that kind of like puts your intervention, you know, not towards more sociality but less sociality. Uh, thank you. Very nice. Very very interesting. Yes. So, so what, one. I have two questions. So. Um, so one is, uh, do I understand right uh, that uh, what your model says is essentially cultural evolution 
is coupled to uh, biological evolution in, in this model. I mean, so that, uh, uh, because as uh, Luis was saying, there is no substrate for culture transmission. Uh, essentially, this may be a model of, uh, say, uh, cultural transmission and cultural evolution uh, in, I don't know, 2,000 years ago, before uh, India, right. 2,000 years ago, something like that. And the second question is, uh, um, <clears throat> so um, I understand that here there is no uh, specialization in, I mean, in this other phase, with high uh, connectivity. Right. It's just uh, like a convergence of the population uh, to being really expert in uh, one particular trait. Uh, Right. I don't know. I, don't few, mind. Yeah. I mean, Easter Island uh, people making these uh, like monolites right. and things, right. uh, and which were completely useless. And I mean, are these two intuitions right? Uh, yeah, the first one we do assume that. Yeah, so we assume the the biological capacity to learn is there already. So we're not modeling that, uh, and we do assume that it's fixed. Although, like, I have slides for modeling evolution of different kinds of learning. Um, but um, the but the the structure itself is evolving. We kind of and whether it's evolving biologically or like socially, it's like social transmission. It's sort of you, you can we, we don't have to like we don't have to commit to any of them. But it is vertically transmitted from parent to offspring. Okay, so it could be it's like culturally vertically transmitted, but or genetically vertically transmitted. But those the propensity to make different numbers of connections is evolving. Okay. So there is that sort of there is that sort of biological coupling. For the second one, I agree. I think this is that is like Easter Island might be a case of this sort of specialized population that like got really good at doing one thing and got stuck in that doing it more and bigger and bigger. But the environment had changed. And but at the same time, I would I would be a little bit hesitant to like say like oh yeah that's the perfect case study for this because uh, because here there, all these traits have no social. The, the payoffs from the trace have no social component. It doesn't depend on what, ter what trace other have. But clearly, does the, the monoliths in, in Easter Island, they they are they serve some social function, right? Clearly, right? Uh, and therefore, I, you know, I hesitate to call them contained in our model because they're not. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, I, w I would like to follow up uh, br briefly on um, one of the Pablo Pablo's comments. <clears throat> Uh, I have the feeling actually that um, it could be it could it could matter to <clears throat> to consider uh, imperfect information in the form of uh, that triggering innovation because right. for now innovation is completely decoupled by, fr from right. the, from, the, random, from the yeah. structure because yeah. it's completely random. But you, you, doing that is effectively like saying that interacting with the others can trigger innovation if you don't think about it as like a copying that trait yeah. differently, but just the fact that now I'm interacting and that is effectively like saying that you are coupling it with it. Right. So maybe it can have an effect and even more like, and this is the second point, it could be like the, I was thinking it could be really cool to also think about even more in this, along this line and, and think about the fact that innovation may be, uh, may be hard to just produce something completely new alone and maybe uh, connect uh, right. A certain degree, right, to the probability of connect. So if you are uh, if you are connected, this can change. A, it will probably change uh, a lot of things. But it can be that only if you are interacting with uh, enough people that you are able to change idea, then that can trigger. That's right. Yeah. You to innovate, and yeah. then uh, then probably that will mess up with some. Like will change something. Uh, yeah. That's right. I mean, I think that's a, that's a very good point. It could change. I agree. It could change the dynamics, uh, especially like you know, like in Susan's data, like where if the well-connected individuals, uh, uh, all the way to the beginning, yeah. If the well-connected individuals are, have a higher probability of innovating uh, here, as it shows here, uh, that could potentially stabilize these dynamics because then if you're well-connected, then it would actually, it would it, well, it, I don't know if it would stabilize the dynamics, but it would certainly, it would, it would certainly change it, yeah. I agree, that would be very interesting to look at, yeah. Hi. Yeah, that was uh, very interesting. And, um, uh, you know, I'm uh, wondering about what this model might say about open-ended evolution 
in the sense of strategy space, I mean, uh, you know, uh, trade space and so right. on. So um, how does your uh, trade space, you know, uh, the populated part of the trade space, the set of trades, uh, trades that are currently right. um, in vogue in, 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 in your um, population, how does that change and how does that evolve? So, um, I mean, part of the answer can be seen here. Um, <clears throat> so in the well-connected state, um, basically, there is, th these never change, almost never change. Like if the environment, if the environment is changing and different traits become, different traits become um, more profitable, uh, sometimes they can, they can shift over, but most times they can shift over while being well-connected. They have to kind of like break down the connectivity and then come back up, right? Uh, in, the, in the less well-connected state, there's a lot of diversity of traits. The, 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 the space that's being explored is much bigger, right? Because you can kind of, this, these are basically like species abundance, these are the same things as species abundance distributions, right? These are trait abundance distributions. So a lot more traits are at sort of sizable frequency. So you, you, at a given point, you maintain a lot more traits. And also, you cycle through traits a lot more faster, basically. So like these traits are a lot, a lot more fluid. Whereas in the well-connected states, these sort of idiosyncratic traits that are, these are basically essentially only known for, by one or two individuals only. And, and they just like blip in and out and they never get established really. <coughs> so, um, so, so the less well-connected, the, the, the generalist uh, state explores a lot more, the generalist sort of the less well-connected populations explored a lot more the, of the trade space. And that's why, you know, all the way at the end when I was showing the, the when the environmental turnover is high, uh, so this is the fast turnover, when there's high fast turnover in the environment, you get a lot more uh, populations that are less well connected, uh, less connected because they can explore a lot faster and therefore they can, they can keep track of the, the, the trade. They're, they're more likely to hit upon the trades that, are, that have high, high payoff, basically. Uh, the idea of uh, connectivity and, uh, and uh, you know, wh what you were saying with respect to selection against connectivity and so forth. So when, when I think about adaptability, I think about redundancy of information in the system in order for it to either get to a new state or to be able to persist. So redundancy in a, in a way leads to connectivity in the system. So if... Um, so I, I would like you to comment on that. You know, whether, how, what, what's your, your, what are your thoughts with how respect is, to redundancy and adaptability? And just one extra thing to, yeah. to, to add to that. So when you think about specialization in a system and you remove the, per, the, 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 the entity that is specializing on that and a new, a new member of the community needs to take on this new specialization, it might lead to innovation because of a lack of doing the things, being locked in doing the, the things right. in the same way. So redundancy, I think, plays an important role for adaptability and innovation. So, so the way you define redundancy is how? That's, that's, it, my answer is going to depend on that. So redundancy of information in the system and the way you will get so redundancy. So like different individuals of, knowing the same information? So it will be connectivity. So I will, I will assign redundancy in the system uh, to connectivity in my network because you were saying that on, a, on one hand, you need to disconnect in order to get innovation and not to be locked into these things. Right. So I want to push back against that bit. Right, I mean, I, I think there's a, there, I mean, I kind of, yeah, we, I, I, you, I mean, it's a fair point. I have to be a little bit more careful about how I say this, but I, I mean disconnection in a very particular sense in terms of like who you learn from, okay? So, um, so the connections here are basically learning connections, right? Um, it's not necessarily like interaction connections, right? So you can, you can learn stuff from some people and then go interact with other people, right? Um, um, in terms of sort of redundant, I mean, I the second point that you made, I completely agree with actually, because like, and this is sort of like, in a way, this is actually what's happening at the group level, because you, you have a specialist group that does things in a very particular way, and the only way kind of to bring, break that is to kind of remove that specialist group 
and you remove that special group by breaking up these linkages, okay? And then what happens actually is like the way, you know, in this like, in this, um, you know, uh, animation, the way people, uh, the way these groups come out, come out of this like disconnected state is typically there's a, there's a small cluster that forms that coordinates on a few traits and it gets big enough that it has high frequency so it gets slightly higher payoff and then that cluster just grows and takes over the population, okay? So it's actually kind of like a cluster level selection going on in the, in this, within the group basically, right? So, um, and that's kind of like the process you're describing only at the group level, right? So, uh, but, but generally I, I tend to agree that if you remove an expert like from like this, a, a particular <coughs> situation like, like in an organization, if you remove the, the guy who always, you know, prepares the coffee in a particular way, right? And it's like he's been doing that for 50 years and then he retires and you put in the new guy to make coffee, you know, coffee might be better. Right, because he does it in a different way, right? And so I agree with that. And this, I would say this is sort of like the same process happening at the group level. Is that, does that make sense? More or less, but we can, we can discuss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over the coffee, which I think is gonna start yeah. right now, right? So thanks I again. I don't know why I said coffee, so sort of fun. Oh. Thank you again for the presentation.